fashion. As you can see, comes very easy to some people. But for others, trying to discern what's worthwhile, meaningful, or even good can be a very difficult task. And for the record, Tom, I personally think that that jumper's lovely. Now, compared to modern art where the worth of it can often seem quite arbitrary, mountain bikes are great because we can test them in the real world and see what they amount to. But before we get to that, I wanna talk about stack and why it's time has finally come. This is my Transition Spire. It's a bike I've been riding for about two and a half years. I recently bought it and it's something I do pretty much all of my testing on. Oh my God. No, I, I can't jump that, that's too bloody high. I'll come round. When I first reviewed this bike, I said it was slacker than a substitute teacher going through a difficult divorce and I stand by it. Now, the mediation sessions were as ineffective as the cooking class and the hot yoga and the couch to 5K. This thing is still as comparatively slack now as it was back then in the summer enduro field test of 2021. One of the things that I love about the Spire is that I actually run it in the high mode. The lower slacker mode is just too much for me and goes over the threshold of what I need. You see, most flip chips are about offering, you know, the Big Bang Theory or How I Met Your Mother. Two middle of the road, crappy options that are more about pandering to the audience than actually giving them what they really need. I like that the high mode is right for me and the low mode is too extreme. What is fantastic about a bike like this is its slacked out position means you can take hit after hit. That geometry really thrives on steeper terrain. Having a slacked out bike like this with a 63 degree head angle is also gonna be good for steeper terrain. And that's because simply when the terrain is steeper, it's gonna be putting more weight on your front wheel, which is gonna play into the security of having a slacker front end. However, I think for me, the star of the show on bikes like the Spire is the longer rear end. This one is about 446 mil. A longer rear end is a great way to temper the wash tactic antics of a slacker front, especially on flatter terrain. And in some ways can help you get the best of both worlds. Another way to introduce weight to the front wheel could be to lower the front end height. Now this can be really effective, but it also runs into a couple of problems. Firstly, you can feel like you're having your weight pulled forward as you ride steeper terrain, which isn't a great feeling. Secondly, what it does to our body position. It can make us feel like we're riding with our head down, looking up through our eyebrows. And when riding, you know, blind, fast, steep tech, that might not necessarily be the best thing. Now, I'm lucky enough to live somewhere that makes good use of the 170 mil, 29 inch wheeled enduro bike that your mother probably warned you about. And for years, I've only had eyes for the Spire. We cuddle every night, it laughs at my jokes and it makes me feel like a very special boy. But recently, my eyes have been a wandering because the existential threat to the slack Dura bike has emerged. And it's a bike that is steeper, definitely taller, and might be able to offer a few things that a bike like this can't quite. I imagine this style of bike is gonna be further refined in years to come, and where it could go is very interesting. The next frontier of the enduro bike isn't then the grim donut, but something that is actually steeper at the front with a higher stack value. To understand why this new style of bike might be coming to the fore, I'm gonna set some homework. What I want you to do is to put your hand on your top tube and zigzag about doing long carving turns, like you're trying to avoid a DUI on a cold winter's night. Now what you're feeling is actually more pronounced than you'd probably think it would be. And that's the height of the top tube changing because of something called wheel flop. Now wheel flop 
is actually quite complicated. And I covered it recently in the Canyon Kiss review. But basically what I want you to think about is if you had a steering axis to so your head angle that was exactly 90 degrees, even as you went through a full rotation of the wheel, it wouldn't ever change the height of that top tube. The problem is that when we go to slacker bikes, as we turn, the height of the top tube and head tube subsequently changes, which affects our balance points and where our mass sits. How we approach this problem and the solution, I think is gonna have a lasting effect on the next generation of enduro bikes. You see, handlebar flop at higher speeds isn't so much of an issue. And that's because we tend to rotate the bars less and lean the bike more. The problem really comes to the fore at slower speeds. And that's because we turn the bars more and we lean the bike less. Subsequently, the inner hand has less support and loses height which then makes the problem worse and it loses height further. Bikes that have more handlebar flop, i.e. slacker bikes, are inherently less stable, less confidence inducing on a slower speed terrain. So then, excessive wheel flop at slower speeds is bad, but so much of what makes this bike so great practically encourages it. So what I wanna do is cherry pick the attributes of an enduro bike that I might just want and use that to arm you to get into the toxic comment flame wall of your dreams. So we want a bike then that is stable at speed, confident inspiring on rougher, steeper sections, has a positive turn in as well as being maneuverable at slower speed. The problem is that most of what I'm saying is something that can be achieved with geometry like the Spire, but not necessarily all of it. So instead of going to a slacker front end, what if we went to something that was slightly steeper and slightly higher? I suppose the question I'm asking is, what's that got to do with it? What's that got to do, got to do with it? What's that but a consequence of head tube? What's that got to do, got to do with it? Who needs high stack when we have long steerers? Hey, yeah. So, if stack and steeper head tube angles are gonna be some kind of golden ticket and give us what we want. How would it even go about working? And I'm sure a lot of you are already thinking, Henry, high front ends are duller and more cumbersome than a pink bike podcast marathon. Would they say that? Yeah, actually they, they probably would. And it's at this point you're saying, Henry, you absolute imbecile. We don't want these stupid high front ends because we want our mountain bikes to be able to nail off camber sections with confidence and grip. Go away with your high stack, you absolute donut. But to that I'd say you can temper the inherent trade-off of a higher front with a longer chainstay. You see, the balance between chainstay and stack height is really, really important. Now, as our front end becomes higher, we take weight out of our hands and it actually means we can put more weight through our feet. However, the longer the rear end, the more weight is expressed via the feet, but not upon the rear axle. In fact, the weight, when you have a bike with a longer rear end, goes through the frame and onto the fork crowns. Now, I'm gonna delicately roll this bike out of shot because it's high time. I actually bought a bike on that I think represents itself as a great example of this new frontier of geometry. So let's see what we're dealing with. Now, never one to be afraid to stir things up with my big old shit stick. I want to explain why bikes like this might be about to break up the dream meme team of me and my spire. So what are we dealing with? A 
a bike that I recently cited as being a great example of this new frontier of geometry is the Commensal Meta SX. But it's certainly not the only example. Recently, we had the Uno burn on our field test, and I would say that has some very similar angles. And there are bikes like that Raw Madonna V3, which to me, well, they had me picking up my jaw and let's face it, a decent amount of saliva off the floor. There's something about it that's just so, just so like, Wah! As we do think about bikes with a higher front end though, it does beg the question, what's the lesser of the evils? To address this, I wanna do some really, really, really bad physics. So Seb Stott, if you're watching, please turn off your computer now. I'm probably gonna absolutely butcher this, but I'm gonna give it a good go. So for a couple of different reasons, our bikes have greater stability when they're going at higher speed. There is the gyroscopic force of the wheels. And also when we tilt our bikes, it also turns the bars, meaning there is a degree of self-correction. But also you've got the centrifugal force, which I can't even say, that basically has an effect on how that bike wants to stay upright. Because as we know, when we're going really fast and we try and lean the bike, it's always kind of resisting that. The bike largely just wants to mind its own business and carry on going straight and upright. Now it's a combination of these forces that means that higher speed equals more stability and that gives us some room to play with. There is a dimension on a bike that we can measure, which is gonna give us an indication about how present these self-correcting forces will be. And that's called trail. And that is where you draw a line that goes through the front axle and you draw another line on the steering axis of the bike. You then measure the distance between those two points and that's gonna give an indication about how this bike is gonna self right at high speed. It also tends to go hand in hand with large amounts of flop. At higher speeds, we reap the benefits of these stabilizing forces, meaning that a slacker bike definitely does have its place. But could one argue that having a bike with a higher front end, plus other key geometry dimensions to make sure your bike is still correctly weighted, can mean you can have your cake and eat it too. As any of you who've ever done any bike coaching will know, we wanna ride with heavy feet and light hands, and that's gonna keep our center of gravity nice and low, which is gonna give us that stability. And a high stack value kind of leads into that. And it gives us a body position, which is all about complementing weight on the front wheel with our hands when we want to, and not having it pulled forward, whether we like it or not. This means we can have much of the same stability as a slacker bike, but with something that has a bit less wheel flop. Now, this goes on to a question that we got a lot after our recent enduro bike field test, where we complained that bikes that had 625 mil of stack didn't have enough. Surely we could just run them with a longer steerer and be done with it. Now that is a very good point. If only it made sense, but let me explain why it doesn't and the problem we're running into. Reach and stack are such useful measurements when talking about bike design, not least because they're so relevant to one another. And they're all about the relationship between the head tube and the top and center of it compared to the bottom bracket. Now, sometimes you can get a bike that has a very long reach, but also a very high stack, and it can feel somewhat proportional. Don't be wrong, big, but it can feel like it fits you. The problem is that when you get a bike that has long reach and low stack, and suddenly the controls can begin to feel very far away. Now, that really comes to the fore when you feel like you're being pulled forward as you go down steeper terrain. And I know what you might be thinking, well, there's a very simple and easy fix to this, right? We can just run a long steerer and maybe a flatter bar. This is gonna bring both our reach and stack to potentially where we want it. Now, this might really fit us very, very well. And as the person that's got to ride the bloody bike, that shouldn't be understated. However, as we bring our stem higher on that steering axis, it's gonna move further and further behind the front axle. Because although we might be getting it to fit us better, we're not changing the relationship between the front axle and the bottom bracket. So yes, it is a very useful adjustment, but to my mind, it's better that a bike has a solid and strong relationship between reach 
and stack from the factory, as opposed to trying to fix it later. Cockpit adjustments are a fantastic tool to make your bike fit you better, as well as honing in certain elements of fit or balance. However, they are limited and getting a bike with the right stack is a really good place to start. 20 mil might not sound like much, but its impact can actually be probably larger than you'd think. Now, I believe that the next generation of Enduro bikes is gonna be steeper at the front, as well as slightly higher, coupled with a longer rear end to ensure that balance and heavy through the feet feeling we were talking about. In fact, we're also seeing it in other categories. Something like the Canyon Neuron is a great example of what happens when you take this philosophy to a shorter travel bike. What happens then if we go to something that is very high at the front? What happens if we test something that you might have seen floating around on Instagram? So I'm just gonna go full Pulp Fiction and pull this out my anus. This has been in my father's family for four generations. This is the reverse rise stem and it is all about a very high front end. But how does it stack up, if you'll excuse the pun? And what's it gonna be like in terms of weight distribution? Well, you'll just have to tune in next time. Now, can we get an ominous Oppenheimer noise? Bwah!